some of those tricky words or I would say the errors that we would normally make based on the way we would structure our CVs or applications back home as well. So we thought that uh, it's better off we have a more uh, enclosed session with most of the finance professionals here who are also trying to break into the market and share experience uh, as well as learn from, from each other. Um, and so we are going to, as you see there from the program, just finance professional CV review, skills needed for finance assistance, bookkeeper role, and of course, those are the basics for most of us who've done um, from the accounting background. Basic tax laws for PAC, for example, starting up a business here, what does that entail? Uh, accounting for startups, common accounting and bookkeeping software. So we thought this would be, yes, it may, it may sound very small, but um, it's, it's going to actually help probably more of open up your mind to what's the difference between us back home and what exactly uh, it's entailed here. So I'm actually going to cover the first part on financial finance professional CV review. I don't know if any of us brought our CVs because I, I did discuss with Cheryl that what I what I love to do is for us to go into the CVs itself, look at them. Thank God it's a smaller group here. So we should actually have that time to go through each and every one of the CVs. Uh, that's what I'll be hoping to, to also help out on. So just a, a brief about uh, about me. Um, so I've been in working now for over 12 years. Uh, started off as um, done several roles around marketing, um, communication, project management back home in Cameroon. Then around 20, um, for 2014. Or 2011, I moved into, I will say, more of finance roles, accounts payable, accounts receivable, GL accountant, um, in our national airline back in Cameroon. Then we was recruited with Baker Hughes uh, back in Dubai for as an inventory accountant, um, 2014, and have walked my way through, by God's grace, respective locations as well, three years in the Middle East, three years in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur. Um, there I served as lead reporting analyst for uh, SSA region, and then later on I was given the North America region as well as a finance reporting lead. And a um, few years into that, 2018, I, I got a little bit bored, like I want to do something new. Uh, so. I was actually pushed to be like, if you think you need to move, and hopefully I'll share some of this as we look at the CVs as well. If you want to move, one of the things we are not conversant is here, they want to see you create that progression. Who is your successor? Because we tend to stay in roles and feel like, ah, oh God, don't plan me, this is where I stay. No. They want to see what they look for. It's not just about the technical side of things. It's more about that leadership ability. Who have you trained to replace you? Even if you didn't have that experience here, those are some of the key things they look for. Succession planning, transferability skills, and things like that. So I came up with a program back in Malaysia on a, a controllership leadership program for the company. And that's how I was moved again from Malaysia into Aberdeen. Um, 2019, November. So I've served in the company, I would say, as a finance controller for three years, but the previous six years I've been in various accounting roles um, within the company, but as a finance controller the last three years here in UK. Um, for me, the main thing, yes, uh, we, we are a little bit stereotypical about the finance profession, and we are always more of it's the numbers, crunching the numbers, but my philosophy has always been about bridging people, process, and systems. Why? That sets you apart from every other accountant, every other finance professional out there. We tend to look a lot about the systems, and we say the process is for the IT guys to take care of it, the people is for HR to manage. But one of the things I've picked here within the last three years it's about how I manage this three, and that has set me apart from uh, most of the other, my colleagues uh, in, 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 
that in that space. So before we go into say good, bad CVs, I just want to pause here first and let's take a minute or so, each and every one of us, just to talk about. I want you to present yourself back as be the finance professional or from a business standpoint. Sell yourself as though you were at an interview with Pastor Will. Anyone can start two minutes. Okay. Any Pastor? Yep. yep. Okay. Um, uh, like I said earlier, feel free if you want to stand. Okay. You're more comfortable. That's fine as well. Like I said earlier, my name is Olavi Um Prior to this time, I started off as a banker. Briefly, in some roles in a branch operations level, where I transited into audit, public sector audit precisely. And in that, um, I did that for 10 years. And in that capacity, I worked in different functions as a um, research specialist. I also did forensic and investigation. I specialize in government accounting, and I also did so a bit of other roles. And in that um, capacity, I was serving with responsibility of training and um, coaching the younger auditors yeah. and mentoring. Then I, at the point, I was um, made the, the ambassador for the office in, in order to face the face of the office, basically, in meeting of the elbow with people. When, well, oftentimes, when we have to do business in the integrations, and the last one was that digitalization of our processes. Yeah. So uh, we needed a business analyst, which was not part of the government department. So they needed someone, and the role just kind of fell on me, and yeah. I had to handle that task. So that improved my project ability skills. I'm, I'm able to liaise with people, with seniors, mm -hmm. juniors, mentor people, and also to mm -hmm. learn first as much as I could. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so you said um, uh, I've, I've been, uh, I have been, I have had seven years' experience in accounting and finance. Um, I started as a, an accountant way back in 2014, and um, from there. Sorry, guys. I'm just taking notes in case you wonder if I'm bringing oh, back. Okay. Um, I started um, as an accountant in 2014. After my NYSE back in Nigeria, and from there I moved to um, the senior, which is audit, because I have a um, keen sense of details, and um, I'm a numbers person, basically. Considering um, um, my background, um, I, for my master's degree, I have bachelor's degree in accounting. So um, the company I work for, which is like Bar Okosoya Co, I started uh, like audit as audit assistant, which I grew to an audit associate and later as an audit senior. And the reason why I've been so consistent was the fact that um, I, I, dis I discovered certain areas which could improve the, um, the, uh, the firm. Uh, that area was um, the area of staff requirements, um, budgets, audit budget, as well as, um, uh, so I started requirement and audit budget and so basically what I had to do was to uh, introduce an internship program and now uh, in conjunction with my uh, alma mater, which is University of Lagos, uh, whereby um, uh, final year students could come in as interns, you know, from my department to the Department of Accounting um, to come and learn hands-on experience. So that was an area I owned and I controlled. Yeah. That was an area I owned and I controlled. And because of that, I was able to. Go on, go on. Yeah, and because of that, I was able to uh, ensure that um, um, the staff requirement was more holistic and integrative. Um, audit cost, uh, audit cost was reduced, and what we call the uh, progression uh, planning was uh, was in place. As I speak to you now, um, some of um, the interns who came are actually part of the, uh, the business agreement. Some are associates, some are, are, are assistants. So I have, I've shown um, over the years um, a level of consistency as well as proactiveness. Um, 
also I can also say that um, uh, I actually also helped um, my mom's uh, pastor's business, which is a school. On a part time, I, I they made me know that the accountant there was for the school was um, uh, there were a bit of shady deals and all that, so I had to take charge um, of that um, aspect also. I I went all the way to ensure that I put in place um, credible accounting um, uh, uh, system. Um, I, I, I actually implemented um, uh, QuickBooks um, accounting software to ensure that um, there was a reasonable process of ac uh, accounting process in the, in the school. So uh, that's basically all. All right, thank you, Barbara. Oh, okay. Um, so Prior to starting up my business, I'd worked in hospital management board as an accountant, uh, and then it, um, most of what we were doing there was just basically verification of um, invoices and, and receipts and um, entry of like, payment vouchers and um, processes of um, processing of payment receipts. And I worked there for about five years before I started. I started my own business where, well, a small, you say, business. We, uh, it was, the, it was a, a, um, a kid's clothing business. Okay. A kid's, well, I wouldn't say a kid's store generally. It wasn't just clothing. Yeah, and I ran that for about five to six years where, as we all know, what you do in business, customer service, um, um, preparing cost analysis yeah. and um, yeah, basically. Okay. Pat? Okay. Um, <coughs> I have finance background and so when I left school, I joined business, uh, a training institute that's um, a banking and training institute, IPOC training when I left school. So what we do basically was to train bankers where we discover any training gap. You know, we conduct a training need analysis for them. Then if we discover any training gap, we have to provide courses for them to enhance their knowledge and skills in that regard. So basically, I was their business development officer then. So we go in and by the time we interview or we do our, or conduct our analysis, we know where there's deficiency, so we prefer courses uh, for the organization. So that's basically what we do there. Then I now then transited into the banking industry where I spent over 12 years. I moved from accounting, department, to treasury, to corporate banking, to, in fact, basically I moved around the banking sector before I left to start my own consulting business. Sorry, but what you doing with the I started off with the Shen Bank. Yeah. Then moved to Echo Bank, from Echo Bank, moved to Heritage Bank. Then I started off a bit of consulting firm to also do basically what business development for clients and providing office solution and all that. We also do basic some sort of businesses where we manage sales. Then from there, I also started another business, oil and gas trading, where we get into buy bulk products from major oil dealers. Then we do, we buy bulk. Then yeah. others and buy from us. Yeah, so that's okay. What and then which company was it? Brooksfield Energy. So you were buying things like diesel, petrol, and all that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Just introduce yourself then in your two minutes and then we'll turn pitch. <laughs> okay, so my name is Sosin. Why are they here? So, um, my so, dad. Sosin. 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 So, my background is in. Um, 
my career has just been in the account section. But prior, before I left, um, I got a job with um, an IMG, actually in Stonga. I worked there as um, the account assistant. I came in there as the account assistant. I spent um, some two years, two years or less than I became the account, um, the finance officer. So basically, what I did was just preparing the capital um, accounts. So we had two, we had three bases. We had three field offices, rather. One in Ejubili, one in Damaturu, and um, Chigara State. So what I did was, what I do is to collect all their donor expenses, and then I sent to HQ. Then also, I was also in charge of um, donor reporting, in charge of um, project follow-up tools that we had in the organization. I handled um, the, the project follow-up tools, prepared forecasts, and also trained the new account officers that came in to the organization. And sometimes I also go to the field offices to um, either train or just support them whenever I'm needed. And I stayed there till last last year when I moved here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Your name and two minutes elevation pitch. <coughs> two minutes. All right. My name is Elizabeth Oyelowo. I am a finance professional. I have over a decade experience. I started off my career in PwC and then on his associate. I went on to do tax accounting, and then thereafter I joined Total Energies um, for a 10-year period. And um, in Total Energies, I've been responsible for tax, for uh, accounts payable, I've done joint venture accounting, I've done priority accounting control, and um, my, my final role with Total Energies was uh, inventory accounting, I was responsible for, <coughs> excuse me, for inventory management, for, uh, I managed a team of five who were responsible for preparing the management accounts and reporting, closing the periods on a monthly and quarterly basis. Uh, quite interesting experience and, and career. Right now I am doing a master's in energy management, developing competencies in um, Energy transitions and sustainability. So, 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 so. Can I? Yes, that's okay. <laughs> so I have a cold, so okay. I have a lot of bruises on my nose. That's why I'm coughing. That's fine. So yeah. which software were you using at Total Energy? Um, SAP. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Liz. Now, show. Are we together? Yes, yes. yes okay. Yes, yes. Now the reason I did that exercise, right? How many of us here are chartered accountants? Okay, you didn't mention, you didn't mention, she didn't mention. Why? Uh, initially, I said qualified accountant. I said, ah, okay, okay. I missed that, sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now, why did I ask that question? I'm not a qualified accountant. Okay. But this environment, one of the things you would have seen on so many job descriptions is that they want you to be a qualified accountant. There are very few roles you'd see where they would talk about maybe part qualified or you are working towards a certification program and all of that. What I have noticed amongst us when we come over to places like this is most of you were qualified with ICANN and you come in and you drop ICANN they ask if you're a qualified accountant and you're not sure if, okay, I didn't do ACC, I didn't do CMA, I didn't do CMA, and you drop your qualification. No, don't. It is up to you to defend that qualification. It is up to you to defend that qualification. You were qualified in your country. Yes, there might be a difference in the process and systems here, but that doesn't stop you or defy you from saying you are a qualified accountant. 
So I just wanted to pick up on that first because okay. uh, Sharon, I didn't, I didn't get that from your, from your presentation. Now, if I were to do a two minute elevator pitch on my career, good afternoon sir, yep, my name is Felix Israel Tabenda. I'm uh, an accountant with 12 years experience, worked across aviation, oil and gas education sector. Um, I've worked across Africa, Middle East, Europe and Asia. So there are certain things which they want to be able to see that level of confidence in the way you present yourself. I'm not going into the CV, but I'll come there. But the first thing, yes, you send in your CVs for application. <coughs> you're able to cross that stage and go up to a point where they call you. We have also noticed our people are not confident enough to sell themselves and sell their experience. That's something you guys need to work on. On your CV now, there are some examples of bad CVs, good CVs, but again, this might be specific to the company I work with, but I've seen that across at least my short time. Pastor Will is also going to add more to that. As a finance professional, as an accountant, most of the key things they look for in this part of the world is around cost reduction. It's around strategy. It's around value added the value that you brought, what process did you build, the systems you used. Those are some of the key things they want to hear about. Is it SAP, Oracle, Peachtree, whichever system you use, try to always understand where you are applying to, which system do they use. If it's something that you are yet to do, okay, that's fine, but at least read up on something about the system so you are not going there blank because one Hiring manager would obviously, do you have experience in Oracle or, you know, yeah, I may not have experience in Oracle. However, I've used SAP. I'm sure I can transfer skills from SAP to Oracle. <clears throat> Systems wise, these are some of the models I used in SAP. I'm sure you would have a similar platform for inventory management, AP. So it's how you connect those skills back to whatever thing they are looking for. And they want to see that on the CV. Second thing I would highlight about your CV as well, I know we tend to have this concept of three pages, four pages of our CV. I also struggle with it. I've just sent Pastor Will my CV. <laughs> it's three pages with just 12 years experience. <laughs> it's too much. <clears throat> it's too much. I've had that feedback from a few HR professionals like, Felix, you need to work on your CV. Two pages. It should be two pages. Try as much as you can to concise the information to two pages. What do they want to see? Some of the things I've highlighted there on my CV, starting off as an inventory accountant, managing over 75 external suppliers, reduced debts by 25%. So each line you are putting, there should be a figure, a number, a result. That's what they are looking for. What was the result? What did you do? What was the result of it? That's the system in which we find ourselves. Each position you're bringing up, I served as maybe lead reporting analyst for SSA. Okay, so what? What will pull in a finance manager or a hiring manager is when they start hearing numbers. That's our profession, that's what we do, right? So when I prepare my CV, those are some of the things I tend to look at. And Pastor Wolf can okay, just connect it. Okay, so some of the things I've seen when we recruit in Baker Hughes, some of the CVs I've seen, we tend to send in general CVs. We don't even go through the job description. I've seen people send me mechanical engineering CVs or finance roles. And they say yes, they can defend the CV. I'm like, yeah, you can defend it, but at the initial look of it, it doesn't make any sense to me. I don't have that time to say, okay, let me call you for an interview. Those squatch, they receive more than 75 or 100 applications a day. So you should always first go back to the job description. What do they want? And as we go along, I'll share. There is an interview I did recently. Sorry, Felix. Can come and do your thing here.
So there is there is an interview. Uh, I sent my CV recently to um, Parker Energy. They are quite small. It's a, it's a, and I did that not because I want to leave my current role, but I was trying to see oh, the reactions of the market for the past three years. Now the recruiter got my CV, and there were certain questions he asked, but his first remark was around. This is lots of results you have across all your respective functions or all the respective roles you've had. That This was from an HR person. So imagine when it gets to the hiring finance manager, for example. So it's more about what is that first thing that they pick up on your CV that should attract them. Now, if I'm applying Parker Energy as compared today to Bikayux, it's a small company. If I'm putting numbers, again, you may ask the question of, okay, Felix, I worked in Nigeria. I may have helped to reduce corporate debt by maybe 10 million naira. How much is 10 million naira to the pounds or to the dollar? You start thinking, oh, that is small. So, but what, remember I said, reduce corporate debt by 25%. I didn't talk about France CFE. If I'm able to get to the point where they ask, I will still stand on the fact of 25%. A curious manager will want to know 25% how much. But you need to be confident to say, yes, based on the economy, which I was, 10 million naira, this is the worth of it. If I have to convert to maybe looking at the company structure back home to what you are applying for here, you should be able to bridge that gap of it. So we, there were a few, uh, I think, a sample there of a bad CV. But those are just the things I wanted to, to, to highlight to each of you. Try to restructure your CV. How many of us were at the session? Okay, have we done that already? Yes. yes. Okay, so we're going to look at that. Um, one of the things I picked here, this is quite simple, straightforward. Now, his five years experience, all of that. The first thing I pick up here is a lot of, this is probably an IT CV, but you see that at a glance, you can see some of the certification programs he's done. So this summary, your summary is more of, it picks up highlights from each of the roles you are explaining, your qualifications you've had, two decades of experience, um, a certified or chartered accountant or a certified management accountant, whatever it is, those things need to be found there at the top of your CV. For me, I always include my vision there. It's about bridging people, process, and systems. And the feedback I've gotten from that is, that's what drew my attention on your CV. Because they want to understand how did you do that. Okay, so let's be mindful of that. Then... Probably before, before Pastor Will comes in, how many of us are on LinkedIn? Are you sure what you have on your CV is the same thing you have on LinkedIn? Not 100%, but uh, basically. Okay, what of the others? Yeah, yeah. pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> now, we are not conversant with this back home, but I started using LinkedIn in 2009 when I started building up my own CV. So what you'll find on my CV today is what you'll find on LinkedIn. If I have to edit something from my CV today, by tomorrow, I'm updating that on LinkedIn. Because let's assume that I'm not quick enough to adjust this CV before I send out for a job. There should be at least 98% similarity of what I've sent out for a job to what is on <clears> my CV. So even say the CV should be a clear summary of what I'm thinking. Yes. You can, you can expand on that. You can always expand on that, but at least just be sure that whatever you're putting there, that document you're sending out, people have also applied without even having a LinkedIn profile. Most of what they will do here is the, the moment they pick up your name and for those, if you've applied on companies that use Workday, you would always see that they ask you your LinkedIn profile. It's not obligatory, but for them, it's easier to click that link and just go to your LinkedIn profile and read without looking at your paper CV or the soft copy you sent. 
So those are a few of the techniques or things I've seen uh, hiring managers here do. And I just, I just thought I'd flag that up just so you don't, we don't continue to make that error. And when you get to the point of your elevator pitch, please always time yourself. If they tell you it's 60 seconds, you need to nail it in 60 seconds. For them here, yeah, time is of the essence, it's value, it's money. That's how the economy runs. So if they tell you it's 60 seconds, one of the things I try to do is practice my elevator pitch one minute, two minutes. Okay, one minute, two minutes. So once you get onto that podium, you should be confident, you should be bold, you should be proud of what you've achieved. <coughs> In this room alone, cumulatively, it's more than 80 years of work experience. And if you've done that back home, you can deliver it here. I say that because, yes, by the grace of God, I'm here, I've done it. There are people who've challenged me Oh, you are not a chartered accountant. How are you a finance controller? But there are managers, if you are opportune and blessed enough to have a manager who sees beyond that aspect, you have nailed it. But what more of those of you who have the qualification? Now, I'm not discounting it because it's one of the things I've had a few mentors who've said, if you want to stay here, do it. Because that's their own market. It's difficult when you're moving from now. You've also had, a lot of you have had the audit experience. That's something that sells here. Talk about it. Which company, as Pastor Will was asking you, which company, PwC, KPMG, they always ask about the big four. Deloitte, those, let it be flagged up there in your summary. Let it be flagged up there in your summary. You would see a lot of the job descriptions come out and they are like, they want big four experience, they want Oracle or SAP experience. Those are the key things. And to, to close, when we also write our CVs, now on the left hand side here, you have your contact, your key skills. I tend to edit this a lot based on the job description which I'm applying for. If their system is what we use in Bikayuks as work day, it filters up those key skills and tries to look at what is on the job description. If you don't meet up to, say, 50% of those, your CV doesn't even go to a physical person to look at. This is not a yes, eh? I've seen the system do it. So I learned from that and I started adjusting my key skills. I may put about five of it. The job description, they have mentioned maybe about eight. I'll flag at least five of them here. So if my CV is going through a scanner, I should pass up to the next stage. So if this is a format you use, <clears throat> ensure that you have your key skills highlighted. On your summary, the system can be able to pick that up. Your certifications, um, your education, your experience, all those things, look for where those keywords are and try to rephrase your CV. Now, we have to be careful here, like, um, sorry, I forgot the name, BC. BC was talking of going into fraud and she was like, fraud. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the things that we need to be careful, whatever thing you put on your CV, you should be able to defend it. The slightest question they ask you about an information on your CV and you dangle, for them is fraud. It's their system, it's their way of life. For them, something is wrong here. This person is not straight. So have that mindset of when I send out a CV, I know exactly what is on that CV. If I'm called up, I know which CV I'm pulling out from the drawer to respond to the questions. All the figures I have on my CV of maybe 135 million inventory management, 25% debt uh, collection, um, 100 million reduction in this, 35 million write-off, they are in my mind, I know them for each and every role, I know the numbers I've put there. So if I'm called up to justify those numbers, I'll tell you exactly how that process went through. So I would love to close there for now before we pass on to Pastor Will, but if any specific questions, then just feel free to pop up.
Oh, okay. Um, from the I lighten the experiences. So for the um, mostly on relevant ones, maybe the, your past experience in banking. Uh, I will. Uh, some someone suggested that you should probably just collapse and say. Um, within this 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 period, banking experience, customer service, without highlighting maybe the roles, the exact things you the did. Exact things you did uh, mm. uh, is that is that is that the way to go? Yes, and uh, I'll let Pastor Will add on to that. Um, I would I would I would have a two face answer to it. Okay, now Pastor Will, for example, has worked for over twenty five years. If he tells me he's been in the banking industry, he's done banking, um, financial management, management accounting, and puts there just the number of years, the first thing they look at is that experience he's probably had this length of time, yes. But if I'm struggling to get into the market, if I'm struggling to get into the job, if I have to summarize my qualifications, it might not pick up the attention of the hiring manager. Why? Those who have been here, for example, if this was probably, I would say, let me, let me use my example in Cameroon. If I summarize my experience, I know in Cameroon, to a certain extent, people have known where I've worked. If I have to summarize my experience, I may do that. But me going into a new environment where I'm not sure of the systems, I'm not sure of the people and the process. I always tend to, first I would concise that to two pages and highlight at least those key things I've mentioned. Okay. Pastor Will, I don't, I don't know if... Nothing to add. <clears throat> the only thing I need to add from yours is you forgot to mention that you're an MBA holder. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but I think... Um, <clears throat> We are going to share a few extra thoughts again as I present my own parts. Yeah. But I just uh, appreciate Felix. For so, so we've got a small challenge here, guys. Uh, we started a bit late, and I must leave at five. Um, which is, I think it's not enough time to really go through what we have and, and I on the next slides. So oh, what we might do is, um, once I do my part, I might ask a little bit to review the CVs, okay. yeah, if anybody can feel. So very quickly, again, I discovered what I left out here. I started my profession with um, PwC, back to us called um, Coopers and Libraries. Yeah, so I didn't put it here, but that's my, never mind the, the big titles that are here. <laughs> <laughs> but basically over 25 years experience, um, accounting and financial management, corporate governance, that's my little CV there. Senior market experience within the manufacturing uh, sector, the hotel and the hospitality sectors, uh, construction industry, and the oil and gas industry. Um, so I've worked <coughs> in UK, Guinea, Africa, and, and the Middle East. And these are my areas of interest. Um, yeah, I implemented quite a few ERPs, about three of them huge uh, enterprises across huge groups. Um, one of them was a, a construction company, um, the largest glass manufacturer and producer in Scotland. Uh, they were out in Alton, but they were actually like the largest glass processor on the one side in the whole of UK. And they had um, over 700 employees uh, with about 14 divisions across the country. And I was the only black person. I don't think I'm black, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one from Africa, really. I worked there for close to six years. Um, <clears throat> I love, uh, I've lectured uh, a part-time role with um, a college called Richard Clark Academy, affiliated to RLGU uh, back then. And um, I was once upon a time treasurer of CIMA. I also qualified as CIMA. Uh, so I'm a fellow of the Federal Institute of Management Accountant, Accountants, and uh, I'm also a Chair of Global Management Accountant. FCIE, that's just fellow of um, Chair of Institute of um, Independent Examiners, but that's more for charities, really. Um, 
or in name of trust of, of charities and um, my current role right now is so I'm just transitioning between there's a company called AGFDL uh, Africa Great Future Development Limited I want to just have, have a quick look at it if you go to your phones just look at it or yeah put it on the let me check it on the screen. Yeah, put it on the, on the screen there. Yeah. I want to say something very quickly. Uh, so it's agfdl.com. Okay. So go on and um, go to. So this is what we do. <coughs> We are into green energy. Um, we, we produce electricity, and uh, we are working on producing hydrogen at, at uh, a very high level, our high volumes. Go to um, go to management. There's a there's a tab for management about it. Yeah, leadership. So go go down and look at. Yeah, that's me there. Okay, but go go back to the top. This guy here, no, not this one. This guy here um, <clears throat> is the. So these two are the the visionaries of the company. So we kind of founded the company together, but they are the the visionaries. He was a former um, head of the Chinese uh, aerospace industry like the head of NASA maybe, but the Chinese uh, company. Yeah. Chinese uh, part. Now, I'm trying to do my elevator speech here, but I'm kind of stumbling. <laughs> <laughs> There's so much I could say. I mean, I've had 25 years of experience uh, over really in, in many sectors. So it is a hazard to try and you know um, compress 25 years of experience over yes. four industry sectors. Yeah, so you just have to find, if you are applying for a role, what exactly are they looking for? Tell and make your CV. Never have one CV. That's a little addition now, um, Felix. Never have one CV. Have at least three. You are not cheating. It's not fraud. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you are just being, the Bible says we need to be um, as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. We need to just tell and make our CVs to what they are asking for. One of the things I've done, which I think is uh, a place I've gained, uh, you can move off from this, uh, just a second. Back to my slide. One of the things that I've done uh, over the years is that, um, <clears throat> how many of you know me before now? Ah, you guys don't know me. <laughs> Wow, I thought I was a very popular fellow. <laughs> no, I'm not popular, yeah. So basically, um, do you, which, church do, which church do you attend? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you, you attend this, this oh, church here? Yeah. Oh. Same as you, this? Oh, let's get, uh, I think it's size. Okay, this church here. Everybody, this church. Mm -hmm. Which one do you want? Jesus. With Pastor Mark. Jesus yeah, Pastor Mark. Yeah, Pastor Mark. Okay, that's good. Anyway, very, very briefly, ah, there's so much to say, but um, RSCG started in Scotland in 1998, uh, maybe 97, but Pastor Chris started this church, or rather joined this church when there was no pastor. So the one who had started it had left, and then he came about six months later. So this parish is like the first RSCG church in Scotland. So he came around March, April of that year. I came to Scotland in August that year and then I joined this church. So I remember there were about six of us, seven of us. During um, term time like this, there would be about 15 of us because there were some guys from LNG Nigeria who would come and we are very happy of more members come. So as soon as it's summertime, the church comes down to seven, <laughs> maybe 12. From 98, 99, year 2000, we were about that number. I remember 2001, we were about 60. Ah, we were so happy. Yeah, but the rest is history now. So all you will see either on these notice boards here, uh, that's what we have done. Um, so Pastor Chris 
does the preaching, I do the finance and the admin and everything else. So I've been working like that for the past 23, 24 years now. Yeah. So I love volunteering uh, within charities. So one of the key things you guys must start doing now is find a charity where you're going to volunteer. Sorry, can I just... Please, go ahead. It's, it's, there are charities you can volunteer, mm -hmm. but getting charities in your own field is pretty, it's like looking for a needle in... In the haystack. I, I sent CVs, one I even showed um, my sister, they asked me for the history of my life, and today, not even, we are sorry. I can, I, I, I can tell you, um, Tosin. Tosin. Elizabeth, that one there, yeah, Tosin. So I, I faced the same dilemma when I got to UK. Uh, the first two years was like, I have to go back. Because before I came to UK, I was, um, I was called a group accountant. Um, so I thought, look, I have to go back to Zimbabwe. All the from Zimbabwe. But somebody said to me, and that somebody is Pastor Chris, the voluntary work you are doing in the office, put it on your CV. So my advice is please find a charity, even if it's your church, go and knock their, off, their finance office. Please, can I just come and volunteer one day a week or two days a week? And then put it on your CV. That's what made me break through into, the, into my profession here in the UK. I would apply, you're overqualified, you're underqualified, no experience. You too much experience. <laughs> I, no UK experience. I, I have to be honest with you guys. I have kept those regret letters for the first two years. They are still there in my folder in the house. I think I got about seventy or so. I mean, I was not slothful in applying for jobs, but they all came until when I put that experience on. On my CV. Then I had some relevant experience, uh, and by the grace of God. Um, well, I ended, I ended up finding a job. All right. Um, I don't know where to start, really. My, part of what I put down here were perhaps more geared towards... Um, I can see, guys, you are, you are all qualified, really, in your, in, in your own right. In, very much so. And like Felix said, don't be shy in expressing your experience from where you are coming because my own experience from Zimbabwe was overqualified, overexperienced or underqualified, no experience. Yeah. So place it on your CV. Now, if, if we are to talk of bookkeeping, really, I think it would just be a waste of our time because there's nobody who doesn't understand what's called bookkeeping. I did not know the, 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 the level of experience shown or qualification of the people we're going to be speaking with. I thought maybe it was more, I don't know why in my mind I was thinking of um, limitless. No, 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 this is creed. Highly professional. Exactly. So, so please, I have to ask you to just ignore what I put down on this slide here. Because there's nothing you don't know. The only thing I want to perhaps zero down on, which uh, Felix and I will just talk through is Good grasp of accounting and processes software. Uh, let me talk to you, um, BC. Um, <clears throat> you are looking for a job. You have found a potential. And you realize that actually, you, for you to break into the market, you may not be able to break in. I'm just using it as an example, by the way. You may not be able to break into the uh, environment at that high level. So feel free to reduce your entry. So what do you do? There are some experiences. There are some qualifications you will need. Uh, deliberately. So, yes, Liz, you may have qualified with the PwC, but you want a finance assistant role. Blank that out. You can also consider us over qualification. Exactly. <laughs> over qualified. Just, just, just look for that 
account accounts payable person or maybe payroll accountant or payroll uh, supervisor or a junior payroll because all you want is the first six months in your study role mm. then you have experience working for a UK company so we are going to just look at one or two accounting software, maybe just one, because you, I think we all have good experiences. I was asking you which software do you use? SAP. I mean, once you use SAP, everything else is child free. Okay. So, so this is, um, like I said, you know this. But the last point, um, Felix yes, made okay. mention of it. This is part of what you must have the skills to network. One of the um, accusations given us as accountants uh, or accounting professionals is that we are so closed in, we hide away from the public. We are like, uh, so one of the things I did personally, um, you know, when you, when you train, there are some rules and regulations you wear green, you know, suit and tie, you are so like, angry and unhappy. No, only that should smile and, gel and network with people that's how you get more info from people isn't it yeah uh -huh. so remember those days we used to go i mean like I, like during my training we had to one of the things we did uh felix is we had to go and count fish in fish pond i mean and you have to give good report back that i went and did the big account. Account. big fish pond nine 20 meters by 30 meters and there are nine thousand fish inside and you have to <laughs> count them really but once you are free enough to let these guys know that you are not a, you are not you are not an audio, you are just one of them. You go yeah. with wearing jeans, t shirts and you start talking about football and all that. And then the guys will open up. When they are eating jollof rice and chicken, you also do the same thing. So you then get to know how they either count their fishes or how they, they, they how many died. Actually it's not about how to count what's inside. You know the finger you should show put in the pond first. And then ask them over the past three three months because these are like six months cycle fish pond how many died you know they are afraid to tell you how many died they want you as the order to come and count <laughs> but how can you count so you just do uh, wisdom talk to this person from your experience uh, you maybe take them out just go and buy a can of coke and then biscuit start eating and talking and they'll tell you oh yeah actually some birds came before we put the nets. I think they kind of scooped 10 or 20. Last week, we, we, we saw one floating, they were, it was dead. So it's not just working from back to front. Yeah. After that, you come up with your report that I believe the, 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 the upper quarter or lower, lower quarter is this, but I think the average in this point should be. Um, maybe 8,000. If you put a mortality of 10%, you think it's 8,000. So I think if each is going to be 200 grams, maybe there's about um, five tons in the, in the fish pond. So you are already giving a report. They will then look at your experience that you came, gave this report. After six months, sure enough, it was within that range. You get promotion because you are a good auditor. What did you do? You network <laughs> so guys we have to go out what we're doing right now is the right thing go out meet you never know who you meet and the unique thing about the uk is that people here don't drive flashy big cars to know who the old guy is they go about wearing t-shirts and, and wearing jeans you will never tell who it is you are crossing paths with mm -hmm. there's a group i attend every monday it's called leaders meeting at fountain of love they are very unassuming people you think they are just little it's okay but once you get to know people with sharon did not know who i am he's just knowing a little bit about me now that's all right. <laughs> so we have to improve on our network skills go to events they are morning um so there are quite a few actually they've actually come up with a list of those places that you need to attend Maybe what you can do is I will send a link uh, to a few, maybe three or four that are happening now. But in, there are some Thursday early morning uh, events, they call them breakfast meetings. There is um, Aberdeen Networking 
uh, group there is uh, like Shimon, he, he, I, I was quite amazed the day you presented uh, remember that day when I said I want to see you yeah he did something in that group and uh, I discovered that these are the kind of people we need don't be afraid to network with the white local mm -hmm. as a matter of fact I mean you guys have to believe me because I've been here for 23 years you have to believe me, these people are not as qualified as we are. Yes. They are experienced. And because of their skin, they get promoted over us. So when we go to meetings, let's be as confident as we can. Not being arrogant, but let's be as confident as we should be. And let's prove to them that being of a darker skin color is not a disqualification um, of... of uh, you know, knowledge. Guess what? The, nobody has divine right to knowledge. So we are as knowledgeable, if not more, than they are. So we need to, to express that. Yeah? I was almost going to say, praise God. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So, so, so just one thing to add on the good networking skills. Uh, one, one of the things I also learned in my short time is if, if I get into an interview and I'm able to identify, say you are from Asia and you are from Middle East, I greet you in a common language from that region. Absolutely. Mm. And that breaks the eyes of the hiring manager. I still do that even within my daily job. I work a lot more with the Middle East people. I greet them, Salam Alaikum, Habibi, Habinti, Yala. So you just use those slangs. That breaks the eyes with them. So always, if, if you can, during your, your networking skills, try to find out if you know the hiring manager. Like here, I think, for, so we, please correct me, um, for, the, for the gents, if your greeting is, I think, fit like loon, and then fit like lassie yeah. for the women. So that alone, it makes them know that, okay, probably he or she is meeting with a few people, learning the language and things like that. So, so is it fit like what? Fit like loon. That's for that's the gents. That's, like that that's, that's uh, I think <laughs> Dory or, or Gaelic, one of them, I'm not sure. Fit Light Loon is for the gents, Fit Light Lass is for the women, like how are you doing? Interesting. Yeah. So, so you just need to learn how to present it. Yep. So you can say just say Fit Light. Yeah, that, that, that's good enough. Uh, but for a younger girl, that's um, she's like. Um, but anyway, once they see that you are making an effort, it, it, it opens. In fact, yeah. I, I worked in one office, like I told you, at um, ACU, which is a construction company. Um, <clears throat> I was the assistant finance director at the group finance control. I enjoyed, in fact, that was one of my best places I ever worked. The MD and the FD, they would send me to Poland. Send me to Newcastle, everywhere. Because they just, I just found favor. Let me use that word. But one of the things that I learned early on was to know that um, iron brew is a Scottish thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. Never call it cooking oil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, because the previous employer, the first job I got, yeah. uh, this guy, um, what was his name? Roderick McCarthy. So we were at a Christmas party. Go to those pre Christmas parties if you know, whenever you get to work, uh, you, at least for you guys. Attend those events. Never be very holier than thou. Yes. <laughs> so he asked me, do you like uh, iron brew? I said, iron brew? What's iron brew? He said, oh, this kind of, oh, no, 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 no. I, I hate this drink. <laughs> it looks like oil and it puts me off amazed. For the next four years, I worked with this guy. He did not even talk. Even wow. he was my worst enemy in that company. Mm. So Scottish or Scots yeah. people, they, they are patriotic. They Very love their patriotic. products. The shortbread, iron brew, yes. the whiskey. Um, the, there are some Walker's crisps. Yeah. All those are Scottish brands. And 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 um, anyway, find a way of plugging in that these are amazing brands. So. Any employer you are going to, you know, to be uh, dealing with that before the job, find out what is the closest brand 
does this as quality brand they have associated with that company or they have closer to that company you just mentioned in person they will love you more mm. and i must confess guys that scores are much better than english but the the issue of racism is still there uh, as another point but uh, so anyway we need to have good networking skills now yeah go ahead <coughs> Um, yeah, I don't even know where to start with you. Like, mm -hmm. Alex said, there, there's a lot in here. Yeah. <laughs> there's a lot. And I think for, for all of us here, it's an area of interest. Uh, accounting for startups. I wasn't too sure, actually, on whether it is um, starting up your, your own business as an accountant or, yeah, or it is accounting work, working for startups. So we, what, what do you want me to talk about, just for, yeah. for, 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 for both of them, it's more of starting off. off your own business, Sorry. okay, there was, um, where that came from for me was there was this um, Scottish lady, she used to be my neighbor, so somehow we became friends, so one day she just called me up and said, Otusi, what do you think about um, starting up a cleaning business? I said, okay, that's fine, but I just wanted to know basically what i can do for her okay to help her in her cleaning business because i know right now I, she can't even put me as a partner so she just has to put me like she employs me so but i need to know what to do for her right. as <coughs> an account or a bookkeeper in so there are two questions you've asked me one question number the first question is can i become a partner as a partner, not necessarily as an accountant, yeah? Even, even if you didn't ask that question, I'm just asking for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> I don't know your visa status, guys, but there's no visa, whether, there's no visa that restricts you from starting a company in the UK, if you don't need a company. Really? Uh, no, sorry. no, sorry. no. Student, student can start. Ah, yes. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Well, well, sorry, I beg your pardon. You can start a, a business. Yeah, I, I, I can only have the idea, but it was not that I started it. I can only start it after I defended my project. But that's the rule. That's the rule. That's the tier, tier, tier four rule. But if you can change your visa, no, you can apply for. There's what we call startup visa. Startup yeah. visa is when you have an idea, your university has to endorse it. Okay. So that means that your idea has to pass through the university mm -hmm. store. Mm -hmm. well, I think so the from there you cannot. I think somebody even said it was through like um, venture. Yes. Mm -hmm. Venture yes. capitalism. Yes. Yes. You guys need to pardon me. My 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 knowledge has become rusty. <laughs> <laughs> things change so quickly. Okay. Yeah, they change a lot of things. But but when you get your two year extension, mm -hmm. you get yes. you yes. can yes. do anything. Yeah. All right. So let's 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 look at that spot. I don't know where where your visa uh, is. Uh, they want to know for now, but. You can register a company. Let's just say after your your master's degree, when you get your two year visa extension, you on and on after that. Um, <clears throat> so you can join that partner. But in terms of what can you or can you not do, what sort of services at your level? My limit. Yeah, of the things you can do. Uh, guess what? Anything called bookkeeping. Anything called of services you can offer those services the only thing you cannot do is the accounting service where you sign off reports before you submit so you can do a booking services get an accountant to sign off your work you can have a partnership with um, so we 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 run an accounting firm called A7 Accountant. So we've got accountants working for us from many, many parts of the world, actually. But our, our clients are in the UK and uh, Northern Ireland. So <clears throat> you can do that. You can offer bookkeeping services. And it's very simple. Nowadays, you guys, again, you are all experienced using uh, accounting software. Nowadays, there's there's not any bookkeeper who uses manual records again, except if you want, you can use Excel spreadsheets, but you, can but you are required still to import them into an accounting software. 
for two reasons. If that company is above the VAT threshold, which is 85,000 a year, then you must submit all your VAT returns through an accounting or bookkeeping software. Mm -hmm. So why bother doing, per, doing spreadsheets when you have to then go to <coughs> a software for submission? Um, under that same payroll here, pay, pay or that payroll um, functions, everything about producing pay slips and submitting the returns to HMRC, you are required to use a software again. So I could basically advise you guys to, whether you are going to start your own bookkeeping service in business or not, get used to some local online bookkeeping and accounting software. There are quite a lot of them. Uh, you know, go to the next slide. Um, Quick book book this one. Xerox. Xerox. Yeah. Xerox. Xerox. Yeah. Yeah. It's not Xerox. It's Xerox. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I'm missing it around. So these are, these are some of the top ones. Uh, we use the first two. And so this free agent here, the guy who studied it was my classmate when um, back in 2004 when I was just finalizing my CMA qualification. So from Glasgow. At that time I wanted to start up, I had planned to develop an online accounting software because the company I was working for, the MD was based in USA. Uh, the wife used to shuttle between Aberdeen and, 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 and Houston. So we would do reports and I don't know you guys, but it looks antiquated. Print reports, fax them over to Houston. Wow. So I thought to myself, why can't you find a way of using the internet for transmitting these documents? So I had an idea, wrote down a few things, then I didn't have funding, and I didn't think that yeah, I can link up with uh, a software developer to come up with. Uh, so this guy, uh, what was his name again, Brad? I didn't know that he was also thinking about the same thing. 2006, free agent was born, and he circulated the um, uh, what do you call it, the concept not or concept software. Guys, have a look at what I've come up with. Amazing. Up until now, I should look back, but look, I should have just taken a bold step to go to a bank to say I've got an idea. Who knows? But mm -hmm. these guys here, we use them a lot. <clears throat> Cash flow. Cash flow, yeah. So this and this. If you want to look at uh, online uh, bookkeeping accounting software, these are like this, like the the market yeah, yeah. They they, yeah, they started off in Australia some years yeah. back. Mm -hmm. This guy here, um, uh, he started off in the UK. Was funded by the by the by the Duke of Edinburgh Fund. He was actually um, a software developer at. Um, at uh, IBM mm -hmm. here in, 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 in Dundee. He went to England, he started that company. Uh, he may be about 45 now, but wow. 2010, that's when, 2007, that's when cash flow was started. During my own working time, I used to do part-time work, in helping people do accounts, just like the guys there, they used to call it that. So I spoke with him, I got access to his cash flow for free. So from 2007 up until 2015, I was using cash flow for free. And then 2015, he sold the company to um, to Key Time. Key Time is a bit bigger company. Then our benefits <laughs> went to pots. <laughs> Self paying now. But just get yourself acquainted to using these online softwares. Um, go on, go on, Felix, to cash flow. I just want to log in very quickly. So I'll have to show you uh, something quick. Yeah. Go to 
to that one, uh, Malo didn't go to the last one, uh, cash flow connect here. Username, type in there, finance at um, none of them. Finance at alpha 7s dot for dot UK. Seven number, yes, for sugar dot for dot UK. And the password there is. Alpha seven s dot co dot uk no password. I was going to show you some of the things that, but again, listen, this, I will send, we'll show you again, I will send links to show okay. Uh, okay. for cash flow and uh, maybe zero, okay. okay, that you can just get yourself used to some of these things and if you mention, particularly if you are going to enter or to try and enter the jobs market at a lower level. Uh, depending on the company size. Mention those software. It's a good thing on your part. And the employers are quite happy enough to appreciate some of this million effort. Let me ask again, what software did you use in Nigeria? Oracle. Oracle. It's a very big software. Yeah. Oracle is huge. It's a huge uh, enterprise processing system. Which one did you use? I used Saga. It's, um, it's a French um, exactly. So because it's <laughs> French, you, you, you know, it, the British and the French are like this. Yeah. <laughs> Talk less now that um, there was Brexit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Which one did you use? Set up. Yeah. That yeah one. Uh, another one that you used before. No, what's Which one did you have to use? Pivot. Pivot. Ah, develop on that thought. Which one did you use? Um, one called Multiplier. And uh, SCP or Pinaco? Pinaco. Yeah, so, so some, so those Banking. are fairly large um, software packages. So, really, depending on the kind of company you, 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 you want to get into, Sage is a very well known uh, UK uh, software. software. So, but it's, it's horrible. <laughs> it's horrible. I don't even want even my enemies to see. <laughs> QuickBooks is good, cash flow zero, free agent, if there are other free ones, but the other free ones are usual, they are, they are generally not as robust and not as comprehensive as um, what I'm using here. Yeah. So by all means, please make sure you get yourself used to one of these. Okay, let's go back to that slide again. Uh, this slide. So I want to mention a few, um, you call them rules or laws, but they just call them regulations, yeah. So if you want to offer bookkeeping services or if you want to work as a finance assistant or accountant without any, uh, let's say, assistant accountant to accountant level, there are some basic things you must know within the UK context. Um, <clears throat> P 
PAY is pay as you earn tax, and it's 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 um, applicable to people's salaries or people's wages. Yeah, and the, the way the UK system works is that um, so much of somebody's salary up to about ten thousand or twelve thousand five hundred is tax free. Okay. It's similar to Nigeria. Similar, similar, similar to twelve thousand five hundred. Yeah. Okay. And then anything from that number to about thirty-seven thousand, you pay. Is it thirty-seven thousand? I can't remember the exact number, but they, they keep changing every year. As a matter of fact, so you pay twenty, twenty-one percent. Yeah. Nineteen, then twenty percent, then I think twenty-five or so. What's called that? There you go. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, the cost is slightly different, different from England. Yeah. So you guys, you are familiar with this thing. <laughs> yeah, just average it to about twenty-one percent. Um, but anything above that, you pay 40%. Yeah. yeah. And then, sorry. Uh, and uh, it's, uh, 50, yeah, so if, if you add the first 10, 12,500 plus 37, mm -hmm. it comes to about that 50. You know? yeah. uh, but the, the general knowledge is that they are tax bans. I think that's my fault. Just mm -hmm. put on mute. So, knowledge of that but also once your your salary is hundred thousand <laughs> something else kicks in yeah, yeah. no no personal allowance yeah personal allowance there's, there's zero personal allowance. allowance yeah so that, that's, that's the beauty of uk most of the information is actually online, online yeah. yeah but it's knowing what to look for that becomes the big the next problem yeah, yeah. but yeah, within that PAYE um, there's also something called national insurance contribution MSC. So again, so much, uh, about 8,500 is NI free. Anything about that, uh, you know, the employee gets to pay, I think, 12.5%, 12, 12, yeah, 12.5%. 12 and wow. up to a, a maximum threshold, I can't remember the number again, about 30,000 or so. Then anything about that, you pay 1% for the rest of your salary. But on the one hand, that's what the employee pays. On the other hand, the employer must pay their own contribution. So there's what they call employer's national contribution. So did I say 12.5%? It's 11.5% for employee. For, for employer, it's 12.5% mm -hmm. from a minimum threshold to a maximum number. Mm -hmm. And then 1% kicks in. Wow. Felix, go back to that slide. <laughs> I didn't know that. Okay, I knew, I knew this, but I didn't know that we now have all this. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yes. yes. Incredible. Yeah, I don't think I'm qualified to stand before you guys and speak. That's why we are saying that we, we will learn from one another. Yes. Uh -huh. So, PAYE is one form of tax. So, in each of these um, lines, there are specific rules. I don't want to call them laws, I just call them rules. And then there's national insurance, like I said, there are also rules there. Um, go back to my slide, please. I managed to log in. It just oh. created an account. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So, but then there, there are no clients. There are no records, no nothing, yeah. No clients, yeah. <laughs> so, but don't worry, I, I will still be able to invite you. Okay. <clears throat> One of the key taxes in UK is VAT. Um, in the hierarchy of um, the Chancellor of the Exchequer's uh, importance of taxes, VAT comes at the top. Um, the UK Customs and Excise Department, they are like uh, real life auditors. They are still very mean very mean tax collectors. If you ever heard about tax collectors in the Bible, I think even that worse than that. <laughs> They're getting best. I, I know of one farmer not far from here, um, Mintlo, for those who have driven around. So one VAT inspector like this back in 2001, 2002, this man was telling us his own story of what he did when he went to collect VAT from a farmer. So he threatened this farmer that, look, you owe the taxman VAT 
uh, for the invoice we brought in from wherever, da, 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 it's heavy. I want that money to pay, otherwise you're going to be a, a dead man. So that man became a dead man. Wow. Because wow. he had a heart attack. The mm. following day, he passed away. Mm. And they don't care. But now, I think back in 2000, between 2015 and 2018, they introduced what they call a business department, which trains tax men to be business oriented and to be audit oriented. So they are gradually reforming. So there are rules there that govern the VAT. Uh, the simple rule is that there are some items which are zero rated for VAT, for example, food items. If you're buying food, um, usually the farmer doesn't charge VAT on the food they are selling. If you as a restaurant, for example, or a supermarket, you you simply package those foods and sell them, you are not required to put VAT. Mm -hmm. Or if you are a takeaway, you can process the food, add value to it, you can still sell VAT free. But if people have to sit down in your premises and eat the food, and eat the food then that food must attract uh, uh, the VAT, which is 20%. Mm -hmm. That's one rule about the restaurant or food uh, shops. Energy, for example, uh, electricity, gas, and all that, that those uh, uh, supplies are five percent of VAT uh, items. There you go. Okay, the majority of it is, is this. Yeah, so food, like I said, uh, I don't even know why we still have to pay VAT on stamps. Those things should really be free and they are free anyway. Um, <coughs> Children's clothes and shoes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Books and newspapers, that's true. Mm -hmm. Now, there, there is that um, the majority of the items are 20%. If when it comes to, I think, perhaps you said you did some training or you were offering some training services to the Commonwealth for the Bank. Mm -hmm. the banking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if you are offering services, say training, and you bring people from Nigeria to UK for training, so that service you're offering because the even though the place of supply is UK, the client is an overseas client. You don't charge VAT on that service. Um, some of the services that, for example, you develop a software that's going to be used on a on a rig that's in the Norwegian waters. Well, even though you're a UK company selling this software to another UK company, but the place of use. Happens to be in original okay. waters, you can't, you don't have to charge VAT on that. Okay, so it's not variable supply. So there are a few rules like that. Um, again, another rule that you know you might come across, not often, but if your client perhaps is um, is a business, um, maybe a property. Like, like this building, for example, let's say you are leasing out offices. You are required to charge VAT on each office you are leasing out. However, if, for example, the buyer of that building when they bought it, it did a clause called opt to tax. It means they chose not to pay VAT when they bought it. Yeah, and they said we'll pay the VAT when we sell it. Okay. The taxman is happy with that because they know that by the time you sell it, the, the value will be higher. Yeah. Yeah. So you pay a little bit more. Whereas if you had, if you if you had paid tax VAT on the day you bought it, by the time you sell it, you deduct the VAT that you you yeah. you were charged on the day of purchasing it. So let's assume that building was opted to tax. It means. Can, you don't have to. You don't have to charge VAT on no. this um, the listing you're doing on each office, for example. There are other rules. For example, if you want to extend that rule further, that 
rule of title tax only lasts or persists for 20 years. After 20 years, you have to start charging fee again. Mm -hmm. So some of these rules are useless because you never come across them in real life. I only came across that rule because I was involved in buying this building. It was more of that work for you. Um, <clears throat> but again, if, if you were to work for, um, for an estate agent, like Knight Frank or um, some of these guys that work on behalf of landlords leasing out buildings, you will come across those kind of rules quite Corporate tax rules and laws, that's where some of the laws begin here, but it's, it's technical. And the good thing about uh, ICAS and, and the big four, uh, the local um, chartered accountants uh, Scotland, most of the, uh, the rules, they cross each other like, like Felix said, your qualification, if it's ICAS, be proud, be proud of it. Go about, say, I'm a qualified accountant, it's my qualification. Uh, some of you here may know, but if you have to go and do maybe a CCA or CIMA, um, you get some exemption from some of the things that you've done. It's really asking, I've been a tutor training student, there's nothing different. The only difference is that this is UK, that is Nigeria. They are superior. <laughs> in the, in the Trust me, there's the nothing thing. different. So, the, the, whatever knowledge you have from ICAS or from well, PwC, if you have to apply that knowledge, it's exactly the same. There may be small differences because UK is, is a nasty system of changing rules every year. So that's why my, my knowledge is a bit rusty because I've been away from um, this kind of work say for the past two or three years. Okay. But again, finding the latest is very easy. Just Google it. And it's there on the HMRC website. So HMRC, that's Her Majesty uh, Revenue Customs. But it's now His Majesty <laughs> Revenue Customs. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> uh, so that, that website, um, Rewind 10 years ago, it was a very basic um, wallpaper notice board. Mm -hmm. But now it's, it's, it's very deep. Dynamic. So, yeah. <laughs> Changes per second. <laughs> exactly. Um, self assessment tax rules. Again, you guys will be allowed to do tax return for individuals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the ones you can't sign off are companies. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of self-assessments, any employee who is earning more than 100,000, they are required by law to submit a self-assessment. Or any individual, even though they are earning 10,000, as long as they are in the area of an airport company, they are required by law to file a self-assessment tax return. So nothing stops me, you guys coming up with your own company or consortium called um, Whatever name, and then you start advertising, you do self assessments. You don't have to know how to do it, just find a software. Type, type on the screen the, on, on your um, Google, Felix. There's a company called Capium, C A P I U M. All oh, these guys are smart. These are Indian guys. Uh, they started this company, I think, seven years ago in London. Young boys like this, I think the oldest would be about maybe 35 now, but when they started, they were very young. These guys got their award-winning cloud accounting software. One of their products, they are called product service, is the self-assessment uh, software. I'm telling you, I don't even know how these boys think. Very easy to use. You don't even need to have knowledge of UK tax system. One of our, a couple of our accountants, one of them works from, from Australia, one works from Pakistan. Very easy. So as you are, as we are sitting right here, you can actually come up with a flyer, advertise uh, to do self-assessment. Guess what? 
everybody in this country can do their own self assessment of values. <laughs> they think there's something very, it's a holy grail, you can't even go there, kind of thing. No. You guys, your accountants, I don't want to use the word capitalize, but just be wise to give <laughs> services to those who need them. People are so afraid to do their own self assessment, but it's very easy. So you just pick a good software, and this is one of them, and it's very cheap. HMRC themselves, that's, um, they have their own free software. Anybody yeah. can go and do their own self-assessment. Self well, guess what? You guys, you can be anybody, you can be the anybody for everybody. <laughs> and use that free software to file their own self-assessment. As a matter of fact, guys, I have to be honest, that's, uh, let me use the wrong word here, but that's easy money. If you are looking for part-time job and you are looking for some, some income to keep going, you can charge a self-assessment, a simple one, 250 pounds. Oh. By the time somebody, yeah, just one. Yeah. <laughs> but there are firms that charge, I think, 25 pounds per hour. Exactly. Exactly. You, you remember how you used to, to, to charge yeah, yourself in PwC? Exactly. You charge per <laughs> 15 charge minutes. Yes. Yeah. So, it's a no-brainer, as they say here in Leeds, Scotland. It's a no-brainer. You can even charge 450 pounds, 700 pounds for one self-assessment if the individual has got no property or other source of income. Like my, my sister here, she's got a business, eh? You start it here, I'll do self-assessment for you. I'll charge a little extra because she's got other business, but she's employed not as a company, she's self-employed. The long and short of what I'm saying this afternoon, guys, is that you are qualified. If you have got experience, you have got good experience. Don't ever underplay your qualification or your experience. Just know where to plug in. So the very quick summary I'll give you guys today is that um, you can offer bookkeeping services. Find good software to use. Start with free one. You can offer self-assessment tax return services. Find free software to use on good ones. And you can, uh, as long as you are outside that visa, the one she will mention, you can set up businesses here. Even if you plan to go back to Nigeria after two or three years, as long as you are on the right, excluding the visa you just mentioned, everything else from my knowledge, you are allowed to raise a company and run a company. And basically, for rules on what to do, much of it is found on HMRC website, but that can be daunting. There's a lot of info which can be confusing. This is why with this network here, um, I will give Sheon again my, well, he's got my contact details. I will give you guys the permission. Feel free to send me text messages or emails. Let's support each other. That's what the Indian community does, or the uh, Asian community, they support each other and then they grow up. So let's do that. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any question, any area you want me to clarify before I get out? Okay, uh, you mentioned, from this point that you made, uh, you mentioned about uh, putting your foot into the system regardless of where you started from. So, uh, having, having said that, you want to get into maybe you want to retain your experience in the audit, yeah. and you need to get into the audit system. And you per venture have been saying um, graduate roles. So in, in getting into the graduate roles, uh, you have to do a bit, a bit of refurbishing of all the CVs in order to fit in. If I get it, and if I get your question right, the answer is yes. If if where did you do your master's degree? Uh, okay. You're you working with it right now. Yes, but I have an MBA. That's all right. But your so, so the, the, gra the graduate um, yes. the roles you are looking for role. are after your your MSc. Yes. <laughs> so definitely, I have to encourage you to you know pile up a bit your CV. Okay. Let it fit. Um, yeah, let it fit the situation. Mm -hmm. Once you are in the system, a six, you know six months or a year later. Yeah, then, you know, elaborate what else you know and what else you have done. And at that time, they can check it out. Okay. How do you approach all the years? How do you account for all the years? Go 
good question and it's always i mean it's one of the questions i ask all the interviews that i've held for for, for, for they have to account for those years yeah. you can account for those years okay as interviews yeah. account for the years yes even on your cv you can account for these i work for this company this company this company but like uh felix said be wise to know what to include in the years you work mm -hmm. so you you want to enter a graduate role mm -hmm. because you know there's a potential for them to grow if you then say i'm in the graduate role but i was uh, a, a, a group accountant supervising you know, seven individuals, you have disqualified yourself because nobody will tell you you are not a graduate accountant. You actually want to take my job. That's one thing I hear consistently. This is looking at the role and see in your CV where to go. Um, JD, they have put on, online, find it where it fits in your CV. I think that's one thing. I'm mm -hmm. constantly. Yeah. Uh, no, okay, the accounting for the years, I, I mean, is that when, when you say you have your first degree, you did in 07, mm -hmm. 05, and it, it, it probably does. Okay, what happens all through these years? Yeah. So, so, so that's the accounting for the years. You, you want to tell the prospective employer that I was not idle, and that's okay. important. Mm -hmm. So, what were you doing between 2007 mm -hmm. and, and, and 2022? Okay, 2022, we know you came in to do your MBA, your M mm -hmm. MSc. Yeah. Your MBA is another year somewhere mm -hmm. between yeah. that 2007. Yeah. These years I was working in the government or whatever, employer, but it's listing the kind of work you were doing. Okay. 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 Probably it will relate to if the, what the, I think if the roles you were doing next to from that 20, uh, 2007 has no relation with what you are applied, interviewing for. You know, you really don't have to go back that far, I think. No. Oh. So there, there, there no, have been no, a few, um, we call it Aspire in Baker Hughes. Uh, that's our early career program now there are two routes you can enter either with your first degree normally we say maximum of two years three years work experience okay. so as pastor will said you can rework your cv to put in certain things that are uh, kind of related to that job description or to that program okay. you know that it's an entry level for graduates okay. now i have referred Let me do people who yeah Please allow me to head out. I have another meeting happening very soon. Okay. okay. Yeah. But like I said, please. Sorry, sorry, where do I keep this inside? I'll give it to you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Take some of your details and then maybe one or two I'll get in touch with. Just to. Well, let me say I'll get in touch with all of us to find a way of getting. Guys, just uh, two minutes for break. Mm -hmm. Two minutes on this corridor there to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I'm even thinking about this in another yeah, way. Like, how, do how, do how do you even know? How do you even know? Ensure that your CV mirrors your LinkedIn. Thank you. Well, how do you do that? <laughs> for, for me, you how know, do you do that? it depends now on who you are. Who mm -hmm. you, the, the company you're, you're, you're applying to, right? applying to really, because okay. they will ask you. Some of them would not. 
So see the candidates. Some of the truth is some of them will not even go to your LinkedIn. That's the truth. Yeah, not all of them go. Not, to not all of them. Depending some on the them, size of, of the organization. So yeah. those ones I'm talking about, you know, your why you trying to do your application. They ask for the link, right? Yes. They see the ones that ask for LinkedIn. I give them. So my link. You have to give them I correct. Have to give them, them, yes, everything. The ones that ask for LinkedIn. Okay. But you see those ones that I believe that will not ask for LinkedIn. Mm. I don't bother myself at all. Just, yes, I just, I just, that is a problem. I'm fa I'm facing it right now because sorry. Oh, oh, you guys no, are saying. No, no, no. no, 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 no she was trying to explain something to me. My my key focus is in audit, and I want to apply for accounting, accounting roles. roles. That is conflicting, well, exactly. because um there was I uh, there was this um this link.